so we're looking at Song of Solomon. Uh, we're picking up on the very most awkward part of the whole book, the whole Bible, guys. This is the most awkward part in the whole Bible. Um, so I've warned you about it in advance. You know what to expect. And Diana miraculously got sick. Yeah. <laughs> so we're we're gonna try and we're gonna try and get through this <laughs> as quickly as possible. <laughs> okay, so once again the outline. It starts out with the courtship period and, and that first uh, first part up till chapter three, verse five. Then we have the wedding from three six to five one. Now included in the wedding. Now, I already told you about the about the wedding pr procession and all that stuff. But kind of the finale of the wedding, obviously, is sex. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> um, okay. And then uh, we're going to look at, start looking at the married life, and I hope to finish this next week. Um, after that study of Proverbs, I try... <laughs> To not spend so too long on any book of the Bible because if you guys remember Proverbs, yes. we were in it for forever. Yes. There was there was never a time I didn't remember not being in the book of Proverbs. Okay, all right, but seriously, okay. So we started, we left off, I believe, in chapter in verse seven of chapter four. So I'll go ahead and read through there. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon, Lebanon. Descend from the peak of Amana. From the summit of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of, lion, of the lions, from the mountains of the leopards, you have captured my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captured my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful your caresses are, my sister, my bride. Your caresses are much, much better than wine, and the fragrance of your perfume than any balsam. Your, your lips drip, um, your lips drip sweetness like the honeycomb, my bride. Honey, uh, honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. My sister, my bride, you are a locked garden, a locked garden and a sealed spring. Your branches are a paradise of pomegranates with choicest fruits. Henna with nard, nard and saffron, cal uh, calamus and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the best spices. You are a garden spring, a well of flower, uh, flowing water streaming from Lebanon. So that's... That's the rest of his um, his speech. Now I just kind of think that this is funny because like they're they're in the process of making love, and uh, he's talking the whole time. <laughs> I just find that funny. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, chapter four, verse eight. This is basically, hey, let, let let's get it on. <laughs> right. um, come with me from Lebanon, my bride. I don't really want to go into it. There's a lot of different views on everything in Song of Solomon, literally. For as many different commentaries as there are, that's as many different uh, interpretations of a lot of stuff that there is. Um, the idea is – some people said, okay, maybe she was from Lebanon, and so he was saying, hey, come with me. Leave, leave your leave your parents and that life al alone and come with me to Jerusalem to our new life. Um, I'm not really going to comment too much on that. Um, there's the idea here, though, that you know, coming – Coming from the north, north to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, kind of the idea of, of um, leaving, you know, the heights of the emotion into the actual, you know, consummation of it. There is also the idea of how do I want to say this? Um, kind of the the riskiness of love. You know, uh, coming down from the Lebanon, which, if you know anything about the geography of um, of, of of Israel, uh, the northern parts there's mountains, you know, and then they have this um, this really really deep valley um, that that kind of goes down all the way into the Dead Dead Sea, and it's the highest point and the lowest point are like really close together in, in Jerusalem. I mean, in, I'm sorry, in Israel. <coughs> and then you know, Jerusalem is. Uh, kind of like if you were to look at look at it like this. Here's the water here. Here's Jordan over here, um, and here's you know the, the the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee and everything. Up here's the mountains, and then he goes into these uh, like kind of like hills over here, and it kind of seems like he's more talking about the process of um, traveling through this this dangerous you know kind of process because he, ta he talks about the, the dens of lions and the mountains of the leopards, but these also um, are Probably a reference to the um, once again to the to the gods and, and stuff like that. Um, so okay, uh, he's keeps on with this you know intimate 
language here in verse 9, you know, he talks about her like a sister. The idea there is, and the idea of incest, like we would think, it's more of the idea of closeness. Um, and then down in verse 11, uh, he talks about you lips drip sweetness, drip, drip sweetness like honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue. It's kind of the idea, um, first off, milk and honey is kind of um, uh, imagery for fertility. Um, it's also imagery for, for pleasure um, and fulfillment. Um, Israel was called the land of milk and honey. That's more of talking about its prosperity for, for things. Um, we'll get into that probably some other time, though, so I don't really want to get too carried away. Um, and then in verse 12, my sister, my bride, you are a locked garden, a locked garden and a sealed spring. This is obviously talking about her virginity, um, which is kind of an important point. Her purity was praised, uh, which I think is kind of interesting here because women tend to give sex for love. Women tend to not be real into sex so much as they're into intimacy and hugging and that kind of stuff you know and um so i think it's kind of interesting that the man you know who typically is only in it for sex is here praising her for not just throwing out sex you know it's kind of like a reversal there of what you would expect um and uh kind of like builds on the idea about a woman who who remains pure is to be praised you know that's a good thing um Especially nowadays, it's it's gotten very confusing for for teenagers to understand um, sexuality because you know really there's no standard for kids nowadays. First off, there's no standard with with personal sexuality um, between whether you're a man or a woman and what that means. Um, but then also, I brought up this up last week. The whole idea of sex has kind of been skewed because they don't really know what to expect, and they're being taught by porn, you know, what sex is like, and and that's completely unrealistic. Um, for those of you who have actually had sex, you know, it's nothing like a porno. Um, and it's just, you know, it, it's kind of, I think, confusing for kids because they really don't know where to turn to and they really don't know, like, <laughs> how they should feel about it, you know? And, and so it kind of just has this, the, this kind of circular process to it. Um, here, you know, he's been talking about, if you notice, he's been talking about everything pretty much from her hair to her boobs, but he really hasn't gone much further than that. He's just pretty much focused on this and this whole speech. But here in verses 13 and 14, he kind of touches on something else. He says, your branches are a paradise of pomegranates with choices for fruits. Um, branches to simplify things, which I think is really good in this conversation. There's a lot of things I didn't really get into with the whole come with me from Lebanon. We're just keeping things simple here. Um, I don't want to spend two weeks on two verses. <laughs> I don't want to do that. So this is just a real simple version. Basically, the branches are the uh, are, are limbs, you know, like arms and legs and stuff like that. The idea here is that he has gone beyond the breasts and that she, as a virgin, it, um, is like a garden with special, um, special fruits uh, that are pleasing. Uh, kind of like the imagery of virginity, I guess you could say. <clears throat> but um okay what do i want to say here spices now if you notice uh, after he talks about these these uh choice fruits is what verse 13 says then you get in verse 14 and it mentions nard and saffron calamus and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense myrnaus the spices there, there's kind of a dual meaning here with once again everything in song of solomon has a dual meaning one of the meaning is it kind of builds on the the atmosphere of just sensuality you know if if you go to have sex and it smells like throw up, it's probably not going to be overly appealing, you know. But these these are, uh, fragrances are more of just setting the tone. But then also it's it's kind of talking about her as a very pleasing uh, to him. So it's kind of got that double meaning there. Um, so basically, it builds on sensual and intoxicating uh, mo uh, of the moment. Um, so, and then in verse 15, intercourse has, com has commenced. I'm pretty sure you guys can figure this out. Your garden spring, a well of flo flowing water streaming from Lebanon. I don't really think that I have to spell that out. I I'm pretty sure you got that. Um, which, once again, he mentions here at Lebanon. This could be uh, could be connected to the reference that he already made in verse 9. Come with me from Lebanon. Once again, the idea there being the mountains. Um, 
which once again would be kind of talking about him romping her heights, I guess you could say, <laughs> for lack of better word. Uh, okay, so um, verse 16 is somewhat a surprising verse. First off, because the woman talks, this whole time it's been him talking. You know, so it's kind of alarming to hear her speak. And what's even more alarming is the content of what she says. In olden times, women were kind of believed to not have sexual feeling. In fact, um, after Jesus, they're, they're, um, what's it called? Um, the Talmud taught about how women were blessed because they had no pleasure down there. So in other words, um, you know how men will bump up onto something and instantly they're horny? They're ready for sex. Women in the Talmud, this is not my opinion, uh, were blessed because they were, you know, they could bump into things, for instance, and not instantly get aroused. Uh, which, once again, I think that the problem with those Jewish traditions is they didn't actually take into account the Bible. They kind of just kind of came up with their own teachings and went crazy. And this was one of the things that Jesus was talking about with their traditions um, is – uh, once again, the Talmud wasn't necessarily there as we have it in Jesus' time, it was, but it was definitely in its um, conception, you know, and, and so Jesus definitely didn't agree with that. <coughs> but verse 16 is really surprising because it's talking about the climax, but it's her talking about the climax, which is, which is very surprising. So awaken north wind, come south wind, blow on my garden, and spread the fragrance of its spices. Let my love come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. So it's not just um, watching out for one person to have their climax. It's both mutually beneficial. Um, so as she's doing her deed, she also invites him to um, join with her in it. And um, so then in verse 1 of chapter 5 is, is kind of the conclusion of the sex. Um, I have come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gather my myrrh with my spices. I eat my honeycomb with my uh, honey. I drink my wine with my milk. The, uh, milk. the idea here, the deed is done. <laughs> That's the basic idea there. Um, and then the last of verse 1 switches from him talking to the narrator again. And he says, eat friends, drink me, intoxicated with caresses, which kind of has a few different points. The first off is he's praising he, he's praising love. It, you know, love is a good thing. Um which is kind of an important point because in the Song of Solomon, love isn't always a positive thing in the book. It, it talks about the dangers of it. It talks about um, the snares of love. It talks about the good parts of love. It talks about you know it talks about all these different things in the Song of Solomon. And love is not a, a, a necessarily positive force in the Song of Solomon. It's a complicated force in the Song of Solomon. Ranging between good to bad to all kinds of different things in between. Uh, one of the things that it talks about is the way that when you are in love, sometimes you can do stupid things. When you're in love, sometimes you act kind of immature. That's another thing it says. Um, it talks about how sometimes when you're in love, you're tempted to go further than you should with somebody. You know, it talks about a lot of different things like that. So, Song of Solomon is a song about, I mean, is a book about love, but also it kind of has a warning of about love. And to that point, I want to kind of emphasize something. This same thing has two messages for two different groups of people. First off, it's an encouragement for marital sex. You know, sometimes married people make things too complicated. You know, they try to. I'm having problems. You know, um, staying pure. Well, are you looking at porn? And are you sleeping with your wife? Typically what happens is men pull back from their wives and then they delve into, into pornography and then they have problems lusting after other women. Well, gee, I wonder why. Yeah, and it's just, so with that, there is definitely an encouragement for marital sex. It, it, it is not just something for the wedding night. It's something that you guys should find fulfillment you know, together. But then also it's a warning too because uh, – well, I think I kind of already mentioned that, so I'll just kind of move on. Um, so uh, with, the, with the narrator here breaking in, eat friends, drink, be intoxicated with cresses, this time it's good. If you notice the other times that they almost started having sex and, and she had to stop and say, wait, don't awaken love, don't awaken love, all those times it was like, oh, no, 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 this is not good. But if you notice this time, 
this time they, they've gotten married and they've had sex and this time, hey, this time it's good. And this time it's not something that, hey, don't awaken love. This time it's, hey, drink and be merry. You know, obviously drink not in the sense of wine, but in the sense of uh, love. <clears throat> so uh, rather than being prevented. But here's another important point that I think men often miss. <laughs> uh, men are kind of like microwaves. <laughs> You know, you throw the popcorn in and you push the button and as soon as it's off, it's off and it's done. Women are kind of like ovens. After you turn it off, you know, you open it and you let it vent out and it kind of takes a while for the for the, for it to cool off. And, I, you know, they're completely different. Uh, and then it takes a while for them to heat up and it's the it's exact same kind of thing. One thing that Simon Solomon shows is that sex doesn't start at the moment that your clothes are off. Se sex starts in the mind. It starts in the acts. In the act a long time before sex has ever commenced and I think sometimes married people don't realize that um, and then here after they've both already climaxed the sexual deed is done it says this drink and be intoxicated with caresses it doesn't say you have drunk it says drink and be intoxicated the obvious point that I'm trying to get across sex doesn't end at climax okay so that's kind of an important point if you ever if you ever plan to get married. <laughs> it's not something that should end when that ends. You know, it, it, it involves obviously it involves hugging and that kind of stuff afterwards, but then even after that, there's kind of this moment of emotional vulnerability where you're gonna be more sensitive to things, um, men and women alike. And that lasts for about a day and a half. So it's kind of important to remember those things. If maybe your spouse is freaking out at you, you know, there might be a reason for that. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Mm. So love is good, but it's not It's not a meal, okay? Now, I, I really want you to get on, get, grasp onto this. Eat friends, drink, be intoxicated with caresses. Love in the book of Song of Psalms is not ever talked about as something that's completely all you need. It's never addressed in those kinds of terms. Love is good, but it's not a meal. It's an intoxicant. It's like wine um, or like a snack. Okay. Um, basically, you can't live on sex. But what I mean by that is don't get with somebody because sex is good. Get with somebody because they are a person of good character because, or maybe because they're a hard worker or whatever. But don't get married to someone just because – Oh, I love them, and they're good at sex. And it's like, well, well, hold on. First off, you shouldn't be having sex outside of marriage. But then second off, um, kind of kind of a big point, love fades, and sex doesn't last forever, you know. Um, so kind of, a, kind of a big point there, you have to get married for more than just that. Now, obviously, as Song of Solomon has already explained, those things are good, but they're not um, the full course meal. So love is good, but it has undesirable parts as well. I already mentioned that, and um, we'll see that again in the future. As I'm sure if you look back over what we have looked at, yeah. I'm sure you will have seen it in earlier chapters. For instance, she was lovesick. She was weak, uh, you know, all this different stuff. It kept them distracted where they weren't able to do their jobs like they were supposed to be doing them. Um, it was almost like torture at some times because they just wanted to be with each other. See what I mean? So in the book, it, it kind of portrays the idea that love – um, is good, but it also has bad sides. Um, so then uh, verse 2, this is a break between – we're now in the next section. Now we're talking about married life, and you can definitely see the break in they address each other differently from here on out, and they fight, and there's little things that come up to separate them. So okay, verse 2, I was sleeping, but my heart was awake. Now what that means is a little bit vague. Some people have said she was aroused but half asleep. I think that's less likely. Um, another idea is that she was half asleep, you know, where you're kind of drifting in and out. That's the one I kind of think. Uh, another one was – another idea is that it's metaphorical. In other words, um, she's not really sleeping. It's more talking about how their love has kind of cooled off. But in her heart, she desires for it to keep going. I think that's less likely, but it, it's 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 possible. Um, and then there was another one, if I can remember it. Um, it's the idea that although she is physically asleep, emotionally she's alive and well. Yeah, that's what it was. A sound, my love was knocking. 
So here she's she's in her bed, and he starts knocking on the door. And this is what he says. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is drenched with dew, my hair with droplets of the night. <coughs> so this sounds like it's um, early morning, like real early morning. And then she says this, I have taken off my clothing. How can I put it back on? I have washed my feet. How can I get them dirty? You know, I, th I always think that's funny when she says, how can I put my clothes back on? You know, I, I, how many men would actually want their women to put their clothes back on? <laughs> <laughs> I joke, I joke. Um, I have washed my feet. How can I get them dirty? My love thrust his hand through the opening and my feelings were stirred for him. I rose to my open to open for my love. My hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with flowing were on the handles uh, of the bolt. Now, I'll just stop right there because I don't want to get too far ahead. But first off, there's kind of an apathy. For whatever reason, there's just this kind of apathy from her towards him. I mean, what kind of lame, stupid excuses are those? I've already cleaned my feet. I'm already in my pajamas. I mean, what kind of stupid nonsense is this? <laughs> so for whatever reason... There's an apathy there, and this is very typical. I think this is more um, your typical response that happens in a marriage. I don't think it's really important um, why she feels like – feels this apathy so much as this is just teaching that, that there's going to be times in the marriage where you know, you're know you going to feel apathetic towards your towards your spouse. There's going to be times when you're just like, eh, I, eh, I'm too tired or I'm too busy or whatever. And for whatever reason, there's going to be something that that tempts you to allow that space uh, between the two of you. Um, now, there is a somewhat disturbing uh, possible hidden me hidden message that I don't necessarily agree with, but it is definitely there. So I have to tell you guys about it just in case I am wrong. Um, feet is often a euphemism for genitals in the Old Testament. Um, spreading your feet would, for instance, be talking about having sex and that kind of stuff so um it implies that she's bathed and and, and would have to uh, let me come back to that so there's possibly the idea that she's talking about i have already cleaned myself i don't want you messing things up and getting me dirty you know what i mean kind of like eh, i don't want to have sex with you you monster um i kind of doubt that but i could be wrong um, now, anyways, uh, it kind of implies that she um, is bathed, she's cleaned off and ready for the night, um, and she'd have to, you know, get, get dressed and, and stuff like that. So this kind of brings up a question: Is she being playful? Like, you know, she's teasing with him. Like, how can I get them dirty? Like, you know, kind of like uh, playing hard to get, I guess, would be a way of saying that. Um, I, I kind of think that that's less than likely because of it says here in verse four, he thrust his hand through the opening trying to get in, and my feelings were stirred for him. I rose to open for my love. See, it says there, and my feelings were stirred for him. In other words, they were not previously for him, but because he was trying to get in, they were stirred for him. See what I mean? That kind of implies that no. <laughs> um, so then that takes us to another bit of dirtiness. There's some people who think that um, the whole my love thrusts his hand through the opening, trying to you know trying to get to the, at the keyhole. That, that is talking about basically an erect penis. I really don't have time to get into that theory because I thought that it was just off the wall. Um, I'm telling you about it just so that you're aware of it, but I don't think that that's what it's talking about at all. Um, it just doesn't really seem to flow with um, the message that, that's kind of getting across here. That's actually why we're reading it in the CSB rather than a more literal translation because I wanted you to catch the more flow of the book rather than um, kind of the dogmatic thing that people make it. <coughs> And so then those people who kind of see the sexual and everything, uh, they think when it says my feelings were stirred for him, not so much um, – where did I – did I write it down? Not so much that she's feeling compassion, but that she's feeling sexual arousal. In other words, as he's trying to play with the lock, she's imagining a, an erect penis, and that makes her aroused. Now, I really don't see that here. I really don't. And so I'm going to go with the assumption that she's apathetic, not playful, and that she's not sexually turned on in any way whatsoever, but rather that as he tries to open the door, she feels compassion because she realizes that he really wants to be with her, and she kind of maybe even feels bad. You know, that, that's actually a very common thing that women do too. They'll, they'll want some me time, but then they'll feel guilty for wanting me time, so then they'll eventually 
kind of cave in towards what the man wants because they want love, even though they want alone time. It's kind of a complicated thing that women do. Um, it's called feeling. See, we as men don't understand that because we don't feel things. We, we have anger and, uh, you know, hungry. and hungry oh. and grog <laughs> smash, you know, but that's all we really right. feel. So this is very confusing to us because it's like, what are you doing? I don't understand these feelings. <laughs> Anyways, so I'm going to go with the assumption that she feels compassion. Another reason why I don't think that this is talking about sex is because women are not sex fiends. Men, men are sex fiends. Let me tell you, men, all they think about is sex. But women aren't really like that. And one big reason for that is because they have so much lower testosterone levels. And so they don't have that in the same way that men do. You know, when, when men think of sex, they think of things like, you know, the climax primarily and seeing her nude. When a woman thinks about sex, she has a whole other series of things that she's thinking about, usually not involving either of those things. Which is a good thing because I don't know if you've ever looked at yourself in the mirror, but men are kind of gross when they're naked. I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's just me, but men are gross. Uh, anyways, um, okay, uh, so I kind of don't really see that as her being the, you know, the sex crazed woman. I just don't really see that. Um, and uh, but here we have the very the very obvious result that happens um, with apathy. I rose to open for my love. My hands dripped with myrrh. Um, her, my fingers with flowing myrrh. Now this is either, you know, she's gotten herself. In other words, when she saw that he was ready, she felt compassion. She got she got up and and put on some like fragrances and stuff, and or it's talking more of a symbolic way of of love, you know, because once again, myrrh and 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 uh, what are they called? Uh, perfumes are very symbolic in this book, uh, talking about love and, and, and that kind of stuff. So it's really just whether it's to be taken literally or, or metaphorically. And of course, the sex crazed people see this as a as a reference to you know her sexuality. Just can't wait to have him and stuff. And it's just I, I really don't see it. <laughs> but anyways, on the handles of the boat bolt, I open to my love. But my love had turned and gone away. My heart sang be sank because he had left. I sought him but did not find him. I called him but he did not answer. The very obvious result that happens when she rejected his advance, he left and took it personal. Very obvious thing. And you know what happens all the time in marriage? One person won't be wanting it and the other person won't. And either the one person's going to just buck up and do it anyways or they're going to you know, kind of just – no, I don't really want to. I'm not in the mood. You know, and then the other person inevitably gets their feelings hurt, and it's very, very obvious it happens all the time. And every married person thinks that they're the only person that happens to. Uh, okay, so then verse seven: the guards who go about the city found me. They beat me and wounded me. They took my cloak from me. The guardians of the walls. So there's a few things to look out for. First off, is this literally happening, or is this happening in her dreamlike state? I think it's literally happening. But there is a large possibility that it's that it's, she's imagining this. Um, another very real possibility is that it's a metaphor. That, in other words, because she was so apathetic, it did nothing but hurt her. In other words, when you're married, you can't allow yourself to be apathetic towards your spouse because it'll actually just come back and hurt you and them. So that's a very very real uh, metaphor or idea there, and I definitely don't. I'm not opposed to that one. Um, but so the idea here is that she she's in a, in a rush to try and find him. Maybe I can catch him. So she grabs a cloak of some kind and covers herself, but she's not properly dressed. Um, and so the guards, presumably here, we're, we're presuming here, um, the guards suspect that she's a criminal maybe. And so they grab at her and try to like arrest her because they think that she's – obviously she's got a cloak on that seems kind of shady. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> but then when they grab at her cloak, they find out that she's not properly clothed, and she's embarrassed, and the guards are embarrassed, and so she goes home, and everybody's embarrassed. That seems to be what she's saying here. Um, however, there, there's there's obviously the, oh, the, the other two things I was talking about, and uh, without her protective lover, she is mistreated. Um, that's kind of a, a, an important point because if you noticed before, she was talking about the man like he was her protector. But now we have – instead of the guards directing the young lovers together, here they're beating her. <laughs> instead of you know 
um, Solomon being there to protect her, now she's off on her own. And why? Because she was apathetic towards the love of her spouse. And that's the kind of things that happens when we're apathetic towards our spouse. But then there's another kind of, kind of, uh, and I already, if you notice there, the last word, they're real with a question mark. I already talked about that, whether it's a dream or whether it's um, really happening. Um, uh, but then there's another thing I want to mention about um, the cloak and her being exposed to the guards. I think there is a little bit of a hidden thing there that because she was apathetic and, and, and stuff, when you mistreat your spouse, eventually it will expose you to other people and it will make you feel embarrassed. Um, that's just something that will happen. I don't know if that's what the what uh, verse 7 was trying to say, but that definitely is something that does happen in marriage. So this is kind of an important point here also to notice. Um, for men, uh, when you leave in a half, you endanger your woman. You know, um, Whose fault was this? Well, it's kind of both of theirs. You know, it's it's hers because she was apathetic, which men can be apathetic too. It's, this isn't a woman trait. It, I think the characters are interchangeable here. And then he left in a huff, much like women often leave in a huff. I mean, this is these characters are interchangeable. This is a typical married fight. They're fighting about literally nothing. That's what married people do all the time. They fight about literally nothing. It's like before you get married, you learn how to work around the person. You learn how to love them. You learn all these different things. And then when you get married, it's like you shut your brain off. And you're like, okay, now you're just going to – your whole purpose is to satisfy me. And women and men both do this. I'm not picking. I'm not choosing sides. Both both of us do it. Um, and if we're not careful, we don't let it stay alive, and we have a very ugly marriage. Or another set, a terrible thing is – we allow sex to come too early before the marriage process, and um, there's just kind of this ugliness that develops from that, where the woman feels more like an object to the man, and it erodes, it erodes the marriage, um, and it's a it's a harm that's very very difficult to to overcome, uh, and usually results in in divorce and those kinds of things. Anyways, um, and uh, but the, here also for women, when you push your man away, you bring harm on yourself. It, it's something where when you don't adequately love your spouse, it hurts yourself. And this is something that's repeated throughout the Bible. If you only partake of love when you want it, you'll never have love. And I think that's one of the key points that this that this part is talk, talking about. You know, she wasn't really in the mood for 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 love for for other people. She just wanted to be alone. But here's the thing. If you only partake of love when you want it, you'll never have love. Because love is about sacrifice. Um, we learn that when we're dating and when we're engaged. But then somewhere along the way after we get married, we kind of forget that. And so instead of being sacrificial like Christ's love was for the church, we kind of become self-serving and expect other people to love us rather than loving other people. It's something that happens not just in marriage but in life in general. So it's kind of ironic here. She didn't want to get dirty here in verse 3, at three and 4 and said, oh, I don't want to go outside and get dirty and all this stuff. And now she has been humiliated, wandering the street and getting dirty. It's kind of ironic if you think about it. Um, love frequently does things that are not reasonable. It's not reasonable that she should turn, or turn away somebody that just wanted to love her. It's not reasonable that she should go out into the night. Uh, without proper clothes on. I mean, these things are not reasonable, but love causes us to do stupid things. So then in verse um, let's see, 9, or I'll go to verse 8. Young woman of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my love, tell him that I am lovesick. So here's this kind of, she's had this whole change. She's had this whole change of heart from apathy towards now she wants um, him. And so then the, then the, the women say, what makes the one you love better than another most beautiful of women? What makes him better than another that you would give us this charge? Um, this is a very common thing that happens. There will be a marital conflict, and people will come and try and get you to gossip about your spouse. You see women do this a lot, and men do it too. I'm not saying women do it a lot. I'm doing it only. But I'm saying um, you see women do this when they get with their, with their, with their other friends, and they badmouth the man about how stupid he is and stuff. Now, men do it too. You know, we, 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 we get around in groups and talk about how our wives are so needy and, you know, they're just crazy and all that. we do the same thing. I mean, we all, we all do it. It's not a woman trait. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a human trait. Um, but anyways, verse nine says, um, okay, what makes, 
So in a moment of possible gossip and complaining, the woman turns it to praise instead. See, they, they came to her trying to turn her to gossiping and, and complaining about Solomon, but instead this is her answer. My love is fit and strong, notable among ten thousand. His head is purest gold, his hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves, beside flowing streams, washed in milk and set like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, mounds of perfume. His lips, lips are lilies, dripping with flowing myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is an ivory panel covered with lapis lazuli. His legs are alabaster pillars set on a pedestals of pure gold. His presence is like Lebanon, as majestic as the cedars. His mouth is sweetness. He is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely desirable. That um, this is my love, and this is my uh, my friend, young woman of Jerusalem. So when faced with that, she just turns it to praise instead. Now. It's important to mention uh, in verses 10 through 16, she's talking about, she's com comparing him to these things in the idea of that he has value and um, that he's attractive, not necessarily his visual appearance. For instance, it says here um, that his, where is it? His arms uh, are rods of gold. Now, if you know anything about gold, gold is not a very strong um it's just not. It bends very easily. So obviously she's not talking about his arms being gold in the sense of physically they are gold. That would be creepy. Um, I think that that's only done by spray tan. Um, obviously she's not talking about their quality in the sense of strength because that would mean that he's very bendable. Uh -huh. So once again, she's more talking about he's valuable to her. He is attractive to her. His arms are like gold in the sense of that they're very, att very attractive to her. See what I mean? It's not that he was the strongest man. That's not the point. Her point is talking about his value and his attraction, um, or her attraction to him. So um, <coughs> uh, they go. She goes through all these things, and I'm going to skip past them because I think they're they're pretty easy if you follow this this right this note right here: value and attractiveness. And you go through the different things and just think about them being valuable and attractive. Just go through each of the things. And it kind of is self-explanatory. I don't really feel the need to, to waste too much time talking about that. Um, so then in uh, chapter 6, um, now that she has praised uh, him, this is what the women say. Oh, where is your love gone, most beautiful woman? Which way he turn, uh, has he turned? We will seek him with you. Now the funny thing is they already knew. Um, can you hand me Kleenex, please? Um, they already knew who he was. They already knew about him. Yet in verse uh, verse uh, 9, they say, hey, what makes him uh, so much better than another? When they already knew who saw, who he was, they already knew about him. And I just think that that's so funny. Um, okay, and then here we get in verse 1. We're okay, now that she has shown that she, she does very much so love him, she's not interested in complaining about him. Um, so now they kind of change their tune. So, okay, where has your love gone, most beautiful woman? Which way has he turned? We will seek him with you. Now, I think that's kind of odd that they would ask, where, where is he, if they're looking for him, right? Doesn't that kind of make, not make sense? Except for when you get to verse 2. My love has gone down to his garden. What? What? Yes, you heard it right. She knew the whole time. She knew where he was the whole time. Which brings us to a very, um, very definite thing that we can't overlook. Now, if you follow what I said earlier, that he is, she is um, literally looking for him, then you resolve this very quickly. See, as she's as she's bragging about him, she's still looking out for him. So, kind of the idea that she's she's praising him while still looking. And so then she sees him in between uh, – somewhere between chapter 5, verse 16 and chapter 6, verse 2. Uh, but if you go with the other idea that she wasn't actually roaming the streets, then uh, actually that kind of flows better in this one one instance um, if you're going that route, uh, is that the breach is emotional, not physical. In other words, she was emotionally searching for him because she was emotionally withdrawn from him. There's this emotional breach between the two. <clears throat> in which case, then um, the cry to help her look for him would be more of a cry to help her to um, fix what she's damaged um, rather than actually find him. 
Um, so once again, it kind of just depends uh, how you translate that and how you want to look at that. Uh, but both are fully possible. Um, so my love has gone down to his garden, to beds of spice, to feed in the gardens and gather lilies. I am my love's and my love is mine. He feeds among the lilies. So there's a few things that she's possibly saying. Okay, first, the love, br the love brings pleasure. It also brings problems and concerns. Now, I, I kind of you know, beat this to death, but I really want you to get that as we're getting to this part of Song of Solomon, that's one of the key themes. Before, the danger of love was more um, emotional danger, you know, losing sleep, that kind of stuff. Here, the danger is more um, more problematic and, 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 and more major in a lot of ways. Um, so he went to be alone in the garden, maybe physically. He went literally to their physical garden to be alone. Um, basically to pout, you know, to sulk. Um, or if you're going the other route, uh, it's possible that it's saying that he went to one of his other wives, um, which is would be a, a heck of a tragedy. Um, <laughs> which um, there's a lot of other lessons there. Uh, first off, the lesson becomes, you know, how sad it is that when he rejected, when she rejected him, that he just simply took it to another person to find fulfillment. But there's a very important lesson there. When you reject someone, they will oftentimes find that in someone else. Maybe not at first. Maybe after years and years and years of it. But just be on your guard. Um, when you reject someone, they usually take it personally because people don't like to be rejected. And so, like, for instance, if you don't have time for your wife, the wife will usually find someone who does have time for her. If you don't have time to have sex with your husband, the husband will usually find his own ways to get relief, <laughs> you know, sexual relief. Um, so it's there's kind of a lot of points there, but I don't really want to get too sidetracked um, because we don't have a polytheist or polygamous, sorry, not polytheistic, polygamous um, culture. Um, it's a little bit different, and so I really don't want to waste too much time there. But I think you guys got the basic idea of what I'm trying to say. So. Um, Okay, so then in verse uh, 3, well, I want to go back to verse 2 for a second. Okay, so she, he says, my love has gone down. She says, my love has gone to, down to her gardens, beds of spice, okay, to feed in the gardens and gather lilies. Now, in verse 3, she says this. She says, I am my love's and my love is mine. Uh, he feeds among the lilies. So there's a few ideas here. Maybe she's talking, well... <laughs> It's kind of hard to know exactly what she's saying. This is one of those verses that is a little bit difficult because of context. So I'll try and maybe mention the basic idea here. Even though there is this damage, she's still confident that you know they do belong together. If that's not what she's saying, it's also possible that even though if it was the other wife, for instance, or another wife, um, <coughs> she could be saying. You know, even though he's gone and done, done this thing that made me obviously feel little, um, I know that we're going to make it through this. Another idea that uh, she could be saying is, there was another one, I know it, guys. When she sees him, I believe this was oh, this was one. There was a, quite a few, once again, there a lot of commentaries, a lot of different ideas. When she sees him, she has renewed hope. But there's also a little bit of fear in it. Um, we'll see that down in verse 11 and stuff. But anyways, so here um, she walks up to him, and this is how he responds when, when she comes. You know, Remember, he's pouting in the garden. She's rejected his advances. He's pouting in the garden. So she comes up to him and you know, starts off with this, I am my love, so my love is mine. He feeds among the lilies. And this is, this is how he responds to her coming up. You are as beautiful as tears of my darling, lovely as Jerusalem, awe-inspiring as an army with banners. Um, turn your eyes away from me, for they captivate me. Your hair is like a fly. You can just imagine him. You know, I, I'm pouting here. Don't look at me. You're making it hard for me to stay mad at you. You know what I mean? You can just imagine the, the, this. Turn your eyes away from me, for they captivate me. Your hair is like – see, whereas before when they were being intimate – you know, he, he delighted in singer eyes, but here they've gotten this kind of breach of emotions and they both feel kind of silly. That's very obvious. She obviously feels silly from the things that she said. He obviously feels silly. So now they're talking together and they both kind of feel a little bit stupid, and uh, which is usually how married people feel after they fight uh, <laughs> for obvious reasons because most married people fight about nothing that's important. 
Um, we tell ourselves it's important, but usually the things that we fight about really aren't. Um, anyways, uh, like for instance, uh, you know, the husband thinking that he's the boss of the finances rather than working together, or you know, well, I said we're having sex, and well, I didn't want to have sex. You know, just stupid, stupid stuff like that. We're we're an obvious, uh, we're a mutually beneficial uh, conclusion could have been reached, but instead there was just a gap there instead. <coughs> Your hair is like a flock of goats streaming down from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes coming up from washing, each one having a twin and not one missing. Now, we've heard this before, haven't we? Rather than meeting her with harsh words, he praises her. And these are the exact words he said on their wedding night, which kind of relays this idea. I still feel the same now as I did then, which is a very important thing to tell your spouse. You know... Let them know, hey, you're still beautiful. I still think that you're pretty. You're prettier now than you were then. You know, I, I still, um, I still, I don't regret that decision. You know, let them know that, you know, I still feel the same. Um, but then also, and this applies not just to married people, this applies to everybody. You really have to work for restoration. You have to work to build people up and you have to work to heal dam relationships that have been damaged. It's something that you really can't just ignore it and hope that it fixes itself. It's not going to. Um, so in saying this, she, he was saying that she was not just a woman to him. And I, I do want to kind of emphasize this. Every man has a mistress. You might say, well, I'm only married to one person. Well, nobody here is going to say that except for me. Um, I, I'm, I only have one wife. Every man has a mistress, every single one. For some men, it's work. For some men, it's a hobby. For some men, it's sex it, it doesn't matter every man has a mistress <coughs> so the 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 takeaway here is that you really have to prize your wife higher than your mistress so what i mean it's okay to have a hobby but when you constantly make your wife work around your hobby that's not okay uh, it's okay to want sex but when your relationship with your wife is reduced to just sex that's not okay so it, there's a lot of different ways that this can apply, but um, I really don't want to spend too much more time because I feel like we've already kind of touched on that. Um, I think they call it beating a dead horse. Uh, okay, so behind your veil, your brow is like a, spice, a slice of pomegranate. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and young women without number, but my dove, my virtuous one, is unique. She is a favorite of her mother, perfect to the one who gave her birth. Women see her and declare her fortunate queens and concubines also, and they sing her praises. So... <coughs> well, I'll come back to that. No, I won't. Um, mm, no, I won't. I'll just briefly mention it. Um, you know, I think it's kind of funny that he compares her to these other women that he has, which kind of builds on builds on the on the probability that when he feeds among the lilies, that rather than talking about their their relationship or anything, they might actually be talking about the other women in his life um which once again it's kind of hard for us to relate to that because we're not a polygamous society but if so that brings up a whole new world of before you you see this in too negative of light remember that's very common in marriage for a husband who's been offended to go look at porn and then just justify it by saying well she had her chance that's actually a very common thing that happens in marriage so before we make ourselves out to be too righteous and condemn them too quickly, remember that we kind of do the same thing. So remember that. <coughs> but anyways, um, so if he is ta if she is talking about the lilies, that obviously must have been pretty hard for her, and was another thing to kind of deal with. I personally don't think that that's what's going on because he starts talking to her. And how awkward would that have been if he was having sex with an, another woman or women, plural, and she all walks and he's like, hey, I love you while they're, you know, having sex. I just <laughs> yeah. don't really think that that's uh, overly probable. But I do think that it's kind of important that he compares her to his other women in his life and finds her at the top because women want to know that they are the most valuable thing in that man's life. And even though nowadays we look at this and we're kind of disgusted with that. This was actually a pretty big thing that he was saying. I'm a king. I have lots of women at my access, 
and yet I, I like you, I, I, you, you're, you're, you're my woman. He has all these women in his life, and what does he say about her? You're the one. That's a pretty important thing. Now, once again, you know, it's hard for us to see that, but especially um, people who get married, they oftentimes have a hard time with the breakaway of, of their family. You know, women have, sometimes have a hard time leaving their moms, or maybe the, the husband has a hard time leaving his mom, whatever. <coughs> but here, he's saying, hey, you're the, at the top of my list, and, and that's that's something that people who go in for marital counseling still don't get. When you get married, your mom is no longer above your wife. As people, some, people don't people don't get that when they get married. They think, oh, I need to respect and honor my, my mom. Not higher than your wife. And here's something as saying that, and that's just totally crazy. Uh, because in the ancient world, it was just commonly accepted that women had to leave their families. But not so much for men. So when Genesis says, for this reason, a man shall leave his, mo his mother and father and cleave to his wife, that's like, whoa, that's a big statement. Um, so then in verse 10, who is this who shines like the dawn, as beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awe-inspiring as an army with banners? And then in verse 11, <coughs> I came down to the walnut grove to see the blossoms of the valley, to see if the vines were budding and the pomegranates were blooming. Basically what she's saying, she wanted to know if they still had a chance. She wanted to know if there was still love. She wanted to know, are we going to make it? And this is what she was faced with. I didn't know what was happening to me. I felt like I was in a chariot with a nobleman. Now this verse is... Very difficult to translate, and you will find like 70 different translations. But the basic idea is this. Because he met her with praise when she was already in an emotionally sensitive state, it completely calmed her, and she was overcome by it. It completely resolved the issue. Most of the time that you're in a conflict, if you just respond wisely and lovingly, you'll find it just smooths it all over. And I'm not just talking about marriage here. I'm talking about life in general. <coughs> So then the verse ends. Um, young, um, evidently, you know, they've kind of drawn a little bit of a crowd, and so they're getting ready to. They're, they're leaving, and uh, it's possible, depending on once again how verse twelve is translated, it's possible that they are getting on a on a chariot and riding away. Um, and in verse thirteen, the the these young women again say, "Come back, come back, Shulamite, come back, come back, that we may look at you." Four times they say, "Come back." Um, and then um, now the end of verse 13, um, it, or I guess it's actually verse 14, um, it's not very clear who is talking, and it's also not very clear how it's translated. How the CSB says, it says that the man's talking, and it says how you gaze at the Shulamite as you look at the at the dance of two camps. How other translations go is they say that the woman's talking, and they say – it says – hold on. Let me see if I can remember. Why do you gaze at the Shulamite? Um, the Shulamite, something about it being like a dance of mirrors, something. Uh, let's see, it probably is in the footnote somewhere. Me Mehenim. <coughs> we don't know what the dance of Mehenim is, so it's very unhelpful. But um, I, if that's the idea, it's I, I think it follows, if it is her talking, kind of like, why should you um, gaze at me? Um, as though there's some military victory going on here. And if it's him talking, it's more of the idea of um, kind of like n not necessarily mind your own business, but um, you're, you're getting all caught up on her. you know and, and so either one's either one would have worked. Um, but okay, and so that's where we're going to stop tonight. Um, we're going to go into chapter 7 and chapter 8 next week, and we'll also try and look at why the book of Song of Songs was written. Why is it in our Bible? Now, we've looked at a lot of different things that apply to marriage. We've looked at a lot of different lessons that we can learn, a lot of different things. Yeah, absolutely, but the book as a whole, why? You know, And, and that was actually a very good question that was asked <coughs> because – when I read Revelation, I kind of have that same thing because people have misused it so much for me. I just kind of am at this place of why? Who cares what happens in the future? Just who cares? I don't even care anymore. Like who cares? You know, and, and, and that's obviously not the right response because God thought we needed it for something. Right. So that brings us to the idea of Unsong of Solomon of why. What's the purpose here? What's the point? So, okay, we're going to stop there. Any questions or comments before I stop the recording? Kind of a comment.
Okay, like, go ahead. When reading the book as a whole, uh -huh. I kind of get the Shakespeare <coughs> type vibe <coughs> from it because it just <coughs> of how it is wrote. Did you know that I was watching a video um, last week where um, there it was was it Shakespeare or King James? And they read from the King James and from Shakespeare, and people had to guess which whether it was the King James version of the Bible or the Shakespeare or yeah Shakespeare. And one of the parts that they read was Song of Solomon. They were like, "Oh yeah, that's Shakespeare." No, there's no flaw in you. That has to be Bible, King James. <laughs> it's just it's just so funny that you said that. <laughs> well, it is a very old song. You know, and a very long song. You know, like we think of metal songs and how long they tend to be, like 12 minute long songs. Yeah. This is a long song. Right. Right. So, okay. Um, but that's, that's a very, very good comment, though. Any, anybody else or anything else? No? We're good? Okay. Remember, remember, if you have any.